Um, I should start uh, by saying that I'm presenting this as a representative of an extensive collaborative group that involved several hospitals, the Children's Oncology Group and also the National Cancer Institute. So my first slide just addresses the fact that over the last 50 years we've seen dramatic improvements in the success of treatment for paediatric acute lymphoblastic leukaemia or ALL which is the commonest childhood cancer. However, not all children have a successful outcome with therapy. So firstly, our treatments are largely non-selective and often associated with substantial toxicity. And a substantial minority of children still experience disease relapse. And when the disease comes back, it has a poor prognosis. And we have a, uh, an incomplete understanding of the genetic and biologic factors that determine the risk of a child doing well or relapsing with therapy. So as part of this multi-centre study, our aim was to study a high-risk cohort of childhood ALL and determine the genetic factors that influence treatment response. So the group of children that we studied were obtained from a children's oncology group study of high-risk B progenitor ALL. B progenitor ALL is the commonest subtype of childhood ALL. These cases were high risk, they were slightly older, they had adverse features of diagnosis such as a high presentation white blood cell count. Importantly, we already know that many genetic factors such as chromosomal translocations influence how well children do with therapy. This cohort of children, uh, most of them did not have one of these known chromosomal alterations. Now in the first report from this study that we described earlier this year, we found that a single genetic factor called Icaros, the gene symbol is XEF1, was associated with very poor outcome, with almost 80% of children that had this genetic alteration experiencing relapse. When we looked at the genetic information further, we studied the gene expression profiling data from these cases and found that they had an interesting feature. That is, they had a gene expression signature that suggested they have had an activating kinase signature, or they might have a kinase mutation that had not been identified. So as part of ongoing studies, we've been resequencing the kinases in this cohort of cases. And so that's the, the key result from this study. We sequenced the Jack kinase family. The Jacks are known to be mutated in other diseases. We sequenced the four kinases in the Jack family and have found mutations in three of the members of this family, Jack 1, Jack 2, and Jack 3. Now, the Jacks are of considerable interest in blood diseases. It's been known now for several years that there's a very common mutation in Jack 2 called 617F in a completely different disease called myeloproliferative disease. In those, this cohort, we, did, we never found this mutation. We found 20 cases that had a variety of different mutations in other regions of JAK1 and JAK2. These involved two of the key functional domains of these genes, the main active site of the JAKs, the kinase domain, and another regulatory domain called the pseudokinase domain. It's also of interest because there were a couple of reports last year identifying uh, JAK2 mutations at this residue in Down syndrome-associated ALL. The reports at that time suggested that those mutations were restricted to cases that had Down syndrome. However, in this study, we had 20 cases with mutations in the JAKs, and only two of those were in Down syndrome-associated ALL. So we've now found, firstly, a variety of additional different mutations in the JAKs, and secondly, we're finding them in patients who do not have Down syndrome ALL. We then examined the functional effects of these mutations. We used a standard in vitro assay using a BAF3 cell line, which is extensively used to study the effects of kinase mutations. The idea here is that we introduce each of the mutated JAK alleles into this cell line and see if they grow independently without needing cytokine growth factor support. And that's absolutely what we found. Each of the mutations we tested resulted in transformation of these cells. And furthermore, when we treated these transformed cells, with a pharmacologic JAK inhibitor, the cells died. This transformation was inhibited. So this suggests that these JAK mutations are a new therapeutic target in this subtype of leukaemia. Furthermore, when we examine the association with outcome, I mentioned that these cases frequently had another genetic alteration of this gene, Icaros. When we put the two together, the cases that had both lesions, Icaros and JAK, had this almost 80% risk of relapse. Compared to cases that had neither lesion, had a risk of relapse of less than 25%. So in summary, we have found these JAK mutations in approximately 10% of high-risk B-lineage ALL cases. A variety of different mutations, they're associated with other genetic lesions, suggesting you need multiple hits to cause the disease. These mutations are transforming, they're switched off by JAK inhibitors, 
And so this would suggest that JAK inhibition should be pursued in clinical studies of this subtype of leukaemia. Future studies that we have planned and are ongoing are to continue a look through the kinase genes to try and find other kinase alterations in these cases, to try and move these uh, findings forward to the clinic, and now to look at additional cohorts of ALL cases. So, for example, in adult ALL, the prognosis is also poor. And so it will be of interest to see if we see, see similar findings in those cohorts of cases.